conflict. I'm here in Cypher. I'm a co director of the State Democracy Research Initiative, which is co sponsoring this event. And in this panel, we will continue to explore themes that we have been developing over the past couple of days, but with more of a focus now on uh, actors at the state level. So, what conflicts are emerging that involve actors who have statewide jurisdiction or a statewide purview, like state legislatures, governors, attorneys general, secretaries of state, statewide elections boards? Um, and on the flip side, what can those actors do to improve our election system? In a way, I think this panel resonates with an exchange um, that was uh, had between Rick Hassan and Richard LaFault yesterday. You know, is the idea that we should be um, state-ifying, elections, or the idea that states are actually going to be part of the problem? So, um, I want to introduce our outstanding panelists, and then um, we'll I'll let them take it away. So, um, in no particular order here. Um, Quinn Yergain is an assistant professor of law at Widener University Commonwealth Law School in Pennsylvania and focuses on state institutional development, teaching courses and writing in state constitutional law. Prior to joining the Widener faculty, Quinn was the associate director of the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy and clerk on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, Tammy Patrick is a senior advisor to the elections program at the Democracy Fund. Focusing on modern elections, Tammy helps lead the Democracy Fund's efforts to foster a voter-centric elections system uh, and work, work to support election officials across the country. In 2013, she was selected by President Obama to serve as commissioner on the Presidential Commission on Election Administration, which led to a position as a bipartisan policy center to further that work. Uh, and prior to that, and the relevance here, she was the federal compliance officer for Maricopa County Elections Department for 11 years. Testified many times before many bodies, um, and um, we're thrilled to have her with us today. Isabel Longoria is a self proclaimed progressive policy wonk who has dedicated her life to public service in Texas. In November 2020, Longoria was appointed, appointed as Harris County's first ever elections administrator, where she served for two years, ushering in new voting machines and innovative voting practices that increased access for Harris County's 2.5 million registered voters. And finally, Gallery Ramachandran served as senior counsel in the Brennan Center's Elections and Government Program, where her work focuses on election security, election administration, and combating election disinformation. She has co authored numerous reports, some of which you might hear about today, um, involving uh, election officials under attack, protecting and safeguarding democracy, um, and other guides for election officials. She too has testified in the matters for multiple bodies. And prior to joining the Brennan Center, she was professor of law at Southwestern Law School in Los Angeles, California. I could go on at great length about our panelists' many accomplishments, but I want to give them the floor to speak. So we're going to have Tammy Patrick up first. And I believe Tammy will stand so that she can also see her slides. I will. Um, thank you so much. This is lovely to be back in Arizona. And I do have to stand so that I can see what it was that I put in all of these slides. Um, and I wanted to focus today, and I might actually take this off and wander over here just a bit so I can, I can see it without um, completely losing sight of all of you. Um, so I want to focus not only on state conflicts, but the state challenges from a state's perspective. Um, and as Miriam said, I was a local election official. I was focused on what local election officials need and want. And so it was only with the um, work on the Presidential Commission on Election Administration that I really had to shift my mindset and think about how are these challenges perceived by state election officials. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about uniformity about ambiguity and enforcement, some of the checks and balances, and then the most important thing of any of these discussions is what are the impacts on voters. So uniformity, or lack thereof, um, can be both in resources and in understanding. So part of this, and I did take some notes from uh, the first panel, which was so great, I think has to tie in as well to um, some of those questions around discretion. So. First of all, of course, when we look across the country, we have to settle on nomenclature, on the words that we're going to be using. And election administration takes many, many forms, as you know, was stated on the other um, panel. So it might be that we're talking about auditors or supervisors or here in Arizona, recorders. But our local election officials, as we know, is this huge patchwork, right? There's about 10,000 jurisdictions. So even though it's hyper-localized with so many jurisdictions, 
for a state election official, their efforts and their work is very different depending on what state you're talking about. So if you look at Wisconsin and, and states like Michigan, in Wisconsin they have over 1,900 elect, local election officials that they are the chief election official for. 72 counties and 1,851, and I should have put an asterisk behind the 1851. I failed to get a hold of, of Megan uh, Wolf to find out what the number is today because it vacillates between 1851 eight, up to 1854, depending on annexations and consolidations of those small jurisdictions. But we're here in Arizona. Arizona has 15 counties. So if I'm a, a chief election official in Michigan or in Wisconsin, that's very different from being one in Arizona. But in Arizona, they have the procedures manual, which keeps making headlines, it seems, every couple of years. And that is one way in which a chief election official can try and create some semblance of uniformity of understanding in a state. Now, this is um, something I really want to focus in on is what does it look like in these local offices and how does this create a challenge for state officials? 75% of local election offices serve 8.4% of our voters in this country and 8.1% of our election offices serve 75% of the voters. So you immediately have this great disparity you also have disparity across the size of the populations in what tasks these local offices are doing in addition to running elections. So in many cases, they're not only the election official, they're the clerk of the court, they're the treasurer, they do all of these jobs. Um, and we know from our work with Reed College, Democracy Funded Reed College, that 34% of our election offices in this country don't have a full-time election official. So if you put yourself in the mindset of a state election official, this creates such variety across your state that there's not only ambiguity, but there's also enforcement challenges. So when we talk about not only the names and the titles that we use for who our election officials are, the policies and processes that we talk about are also a question of semantics and understanding. So in most states, absentee voting, vote by mail, voting at home, those all mean the same thing, but not if you're in Missouri or Missouri, depending. Um, so they're not always interchangeable and that can really muddy the waters. We also know from the alphabet soup of federal legislation that federal laws often state certain roles and responsibility of the chief election official in a state, but in most cases, that chief election official has no enforcement ability or power to make the local constitutionally um, um, elected, in, most, in many cases, officials do whatever this federal law is tasking the chief election official with doing. So that's a real tension. And we know that no matter what, we want our elections fast, cheap, and accurate, but you only get to pick two. And what our motivations are between each of these things tends to shift at the state, whether you're talking to the legislature, executive branch, and otherwise. So what are our checks and balances? Um, we heard a lot about this in the first um, panel as well, is that there are checks and balances within each level of government, right? So whether we're talking about local election officials or at the state level, there are partisan officials that check and balance each other. We have different branches within that level of government. This is from St. Louis County, and in order to get into their tabulation center, you need to have both the D and the R commissioner there to open up and get in. We also know that there's, there are checks and balances between the local government layer and that state level. Um, and so it was mentioned earlier, the Otero County um, example, so these various checks and balances across the system are really important when there are still officials who are committed to free and fair elections. And I say that purposely because we've, we've talked a lot about anti-democratic candidates or election denier candidates, how impactful that's gonna be. It's very different to have one person at a state or local level get elected into an office than if a slate of candidates get elected. 
very different things. So what is the kind of impact that we have on voters and their voting options? Um, this, Next few slides are slides that I love to share. They're from Charles Stewart at MIT. Um, I've affectionately termed them the snow globe of elections, and Charles has um, adopted that. But what we're looking at here, um, it's another triangle chart. But at the top, we have election day voting. On the lower, your left hand, my right, um, voting by mail, and then early voting in person. So this is 1996. Almost everybody was voting. Um, on election day, with a few exceptions out west, right? Oregon, Washington, California, here in Arizona. So 96, 2000, here's the snow globe starts to kick in. 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016. You all know what's gonna happen in 2020, right? So 2020, everything falls down um, with some very, very prominent um, outliers at the top that did not change their procedures um, in order to accommodate um, very much during the, the global pandemic. So all of these tensions, and why is it the case that this happened? In some cases, as was mentioned, there were um, governor's executive decrees. There were some legislation that were passed only for 2020, and, and there were a number of other discretionary policy decisions and administration that took place. So. The truth is, is that we know that 2020 was the most secure. Chris Krebs has said that repeatedly. Um, but it was also the most observed, the most transparent, the most audited, the most litigated, with the highest number of votes in US history, all in the midst of a global pandemic. So the last thing I wanted to mention is for anyone who's really interested in kind of how this all plays out across the states, um, every morning by about 6.30, Monday through Friday, uh, electionline.org puts out an accumulation of news stories from all the local newsrooms in, every, in any state that has something related to election administration. It's free, you can sign up, they'll deliver it right to your inbox. Um, and that's, a, I think, a really good resource to keep an eye on what's happening across the states. And then also, as was already mentioned, um, the Election Performance Index at MIT's Election Data Science Lab. And with that, that's my contact information. And I'm going to now bring the microphone over, as I said I would, <laughs> to the next uh, speaker. All right. Well, first, obviously, um, I'm immensely appreciative to the center for putting this together, to Miriam for moderating this. Um, as she said, my background is in state constitutional law. So I'm constantly thinking about the role that institutions play, the relationship that they have with each other, and how institutional development affects outcomes. Um, I note that a lot of people have begun their remarks by saying, you know, I'm a glass half full person, or I'm optimistic, or I'm pessimistic. I really don't know what I am. Um, despite the fact that I, I write in this space and I think about stuff like this constantly, I find that I feel like I'm constantly covering my eyes and plugging my ears and pretending that all of this stuff that we're thinking about academically is not also playing out in the real world. Um, so this uh, opportunity to actually think about it in the real world is gratifying and horrifying all at the same time. I'll give away my immediate conclusion, um, which is that I think that at the state level, which is, in my opinion, the same at the local level, we have too many institutions with too many overlapping powers in not obvious ways to solve the conflicts that arise between them. And this proliferation of responsibility creates a lot of openings for malicious actors to come in or for disruptions to take place. Um, and the way that I, I think about stuff like this is necessarily legally historically driven. Um, in the early days of the United States, for example, we did not have a lot of statewide elections. A lot of states did not have directly elected governors. Most of them, or a fair number of them, had indirectly elected governors. Um, and so the real elections that we were talking about at the state level are for legislature. And so legislatures themselves, by virtue of their power to judge election results, um, frequently received election results for legislative elections, decided who ultimately won. They also had the power to do so in states with directly elected governors. Legislatures were frequently the ones that received these results, canvassed them, and declared winners. Historically, legislatures have also had the responsibility of adjudicating uh, contests of statewide election results, especially with respect to gubernatorial elections. Um, and it is indeed the case that many states today still have both of those, or state legislatures still have both of those responsibilities. 
the first responsibility, which is almost always formal today, to receive the results for gubernatorial elections, to tally them, and to declare a winner, as well as the ability to decide contests. Um, and we would describe these as formal, respo formal responsibilities, formal processes that have never, ever really been used that much before. But you could have said that about any aspect of election administration before 2000, before 2020. So I'm worried about stuff like that, for example. Um, the most recent time I'm aware of that a legislature annulled the results of a statewide election was 1904 in Colorado when the Democratic candidate apparently won, but the legislature declared that the Republican had actually won. Um, that produced what became known as the, the day of three governors in Colorado as they dealt with the, the reality of that. Um, but deciding contests is something that is relevant now. In 2019 in Kentucky, when Republican Governor Matt Bevin narrowly lost re-election, and a recount didn't change anything, it was close, but not that close, he threatened to go to the legislature to have them overturn the result. I think the legislature, despite being Republican controlled, realized Matt Bevin is really unpopular, and the veto override threshold is just a simple majority, so it doesn't really matter if he's here or not, and we're not gonna stick our necks out in this way for him. Um, and so they didn't. So legislatures still have a lot of this power, but as elected officials were created in the 19th century during the Jacksonian era, as state governments were democratized, and we had secretaries of state, lieutenant governors, auditors, treasurers, um, not mine inspectors, that's, that's a special Arizona thing for the most part, um, we had to think about different ways to deal with how these election results were processed and how elections were administered. And secretaries of state were one of the common officials to administer these elections to receive initial results. State constitutions also created then canvassing boards. The most common way to do that historically was to take other statewide elected officials and have them sort of wear two hats. They had their formal responsibilities by virtue of the office to which they were elected, and then they also served on these canvassing boards. Now, there's obvious problems with that too, and a lot of states still have this, that you might end up with canvassing boards that are all members of one party. And we're also talking about people who are elected in partisan elections, canvassing the results for partisan elections in which they are themselves frequently candidates. Though vice presidents have historically admirably done the job of declaring their own losses, this is something that's happened a lot at the state level. And it hasn't resulted in a lot of conflict, but we, again, two different systems that have developed and concerns about how partisan they are. And in the mid 20th century, there were some pretty serious concerns in some states that had rounds of close election after close election after close election of how this was actually done. And in Michigan, for example, Michigan is, I think, always relevant when we're talking about election administration. They had a series of very close gubernatorial elections. And in 1955, the legislature put a constitutional amendment on the ballot that changed the Board of State canvassers from the treasurer, the secretary of state, the superintendent of public instruction to a bipartisan board. It's one of the only bipartisan canvassing boards at the state level that is in a state constitution. And they did it, they said, because they wanted bipartisan buy-in. If you have an equal number of Democrats and Republicans, and the only way you can do anything is by having buy-in that way, then you force bipartisan action, or so the theory goes. And when both parties were equally committed to the same norms and values, not a problem. Today, though, a much more significant problem. You then have uh, states that are creating boards of elections or election commissioners on top of this that exercise some sort of concurrent election administration responsibility with secretaries of state. And where the line falls between what the Secretary of State can do and what the Board of Elections can do um, is a little bit of a moving target depending on how much the legislature likes the Secretary of State and whether the legislature and the Secretary of State are members of the same party. Um, for example, when Kentucky Secretary of State Allison Lundergan Grimes attempted to uh, implement automatic voter registration administratively, the legislature had a big problem with that and removed her power to do that and also removed a lot of her power to promulgate rules and gave it to the State Board of Elections. As uh, an election denier, won the Republican primary for Secretary of State in Wyoming and will be the Secretary of State because he is uncontested, uh, the legislature, there's rumblings that the legislature is going to take away some of the Secretary of State's responsibilities and vest it in somebody or some other body. And so as we think about all of this stuff, there are many different ways in which ballots are canvassed. We have these dual processes that are operating at the same time, and I'm honestly simplifying it. 
because depending on what state you're in, you know, if as you vote for different things on your ballot, obviously it's the case that local offices and local elections are canvassed by local officials, and they're the ones who declare results. But even at the same level, horizontally, at the state level, you might have one body that canvasses results for governor, another for other statewide offices, another for Supreme Court justices, and another for amendments altogether. So there are a lot of openings here. And I, to me, one of the big takeaways of election administration is the more openings you have, the more vulnerable the system is. And yeah, it creates checks and balances. But my perspective with all of this is, when you have too many officials with too much responsibility, it's too diffused, it's too distributed. I mean, we, could, we can relitigate a lot of these conversations about you know, local election administration, but I think that at the state level, it's, it's much of the same, um, and there's a lot more moving parts because local election administration has largely remained the same from the 19th century to the present in terms of what it actually looks like. If you look at a statute in Alabama or Missouri in the mid 1800s to see you know, how were they actually administering elections, you could almost cut and paste it into statutes today and it's gonna look pretty much the same. That's not true with statewide election administration. So as these changes take place, they create too many tracks that are operating at the same time, in my view. Um, and you know, this is, a, I guess, in theory, where I'm supposed to come to some sort of conclusion or solution, um, because that's what we do, right? As law professors, we, we speak from our ivory towers. Um, but from my second story uh, window in a very brutalist building um, in Harrisburg, um, I'm not sure that I have a prescriptive solution. I think that my tendency might be that maybe we should have election administration housed in a state civil service, for example, um, protections from partisan uh, influence. Um, but I would want to see much more data on that before establishing that as my uh, ultimate conclusion. Um, and with that, I conclude. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, as Miriam mentioned in my bio, I used to be a law professor. I fled academia in the summer of 2019, uh, thinking that I was going to save the election from Russian disinformation. <laughs> and now I'm permanently at the Brennan Center. And um, But it's super fun to be back at an academic conference and remember what it was like, um, especially after you know being away from people for so long in the pandemic. So it's been really a pleasure to be here. And uh, so uh, intellectually stimulating while also horrifying um, at the same time. Um, okay, so the title of this panel uh, has to do with state level conflict. And on some level, I agree that yes, we've seen a lot of state level conflict over election law procedures, over results recently. Um, but what I wanna say is a little bit counter to like, unfortunately, I think the <coughs> aim of the, uh, or the sort of mission of the sponsors of this conference, which is that um, I don't think, um, and others have said this um, at the conference so far, I don't think this conflict that we're seeing and these fears that we have are really the product of any kind of constitutional or legal design, right? I think it's other things that are driving what's happening. Um, so for instance, I think reasonable people can disagree about some of the things that folks have disagreed about at the state level in recent years, right? Like, is the pandemic sufficient cause to postpone the postmark deadline or whatever it is, right? Reasonable people can disagree about that and what's the right interpretation of the law in those cases. But when it comes to things like whether to certify, whether to count votes that were submitted validly under the terms of a court order or administrative guidance at the time that the voters acted, right? Like, so are you gonna count absentee ballots that were mailed on time um, under the stated law at the time with the advice voters were being given about when they could return it? Um, whether to give uh, equipment access to unauthorized, completely partisan actors, right? Like in the Tina Peters case, those kinds of questions I don't think it's like really complete to describe what's happening as a conflict between competing sources of authority, right? These are not actually reasonable <laughs> disagreements or reasonable uh, differences in legal interpretation. Um, 
And so, and I think thinking about it in terms of conflict makes us think like, well, let's clarify the authority. Let's clarify like who who's responsible uh, in this case. And I think instead, what we should thinking about is how can we make things so that the pro democracy side of the conflict wins, right? Like that's what we want. The aim is not resolving the conflict; it's resolving it in the direction uh, of democracy and um, you know, sort of the will of the voters. Um, and I think, you know, we've all talked about um, quite a bit at this conference that what we're really seeing is foundationally driven um, not by anything in the clarity of the law or the constitutional design, but just um, a departure from pre-existing social and institutional norms um, that election administration should be a process or the ultimate goal is fulfilling the will of the voters. Um, and we wrote uh, this report last year at the Brennan Center uh, that I think in retrospect was actually a documentation of like all the ways in which um, people have been departing from that norm um, and exerting pressure on election officials to do something other than just um, try to get an accurate election. Um, so it's called Election Officials Under Attack, the report we put out. We put it out, um, we co-authored it with the Bipartisan Policy Center and also some of the research that, that went into it was done in conjunction with the Ash Center at Harvard. Um, and there's all these different forms of pressure in the report. Um, so uh, one form of pressure uh, is unfortunately violent threats and harassment uh, against election officials and election workers. Another form of pressure is um, sort of like threats to criminalize, like reasonable different <laughs> legal interpretations of election officials. Another form is this kind of like relentless hurricane of misinformation that election officials now have to deal with. Um, and that really is incredibly demoralizing. Like when you work really, really hard and you're underpaid and understaffed and then you're being told constantly that you're a liar and a cheater, like it is very hard to sort of keep up. Um, keep up doing a good job uh, at your work. And, you know, we're, so I think everyone actually at this conference seems to agree that like this departure from the social norm, like the Republican Party getting overtaken by uh, some of these forces is really the underlying um, problem. And I think that doesn't mean that sort of redesigns um, to the Constitution or to the structure of how we uh, administer elections are irrelevant. Like I think we could still have an intervention um, that seeks to sort of beef up nonpartisan and fair election administration um, through those sort of structural reforms, even if it wasn't a structural failure. That is actually what underlied uh, what we're seeing now. But I want to kind of really um, sort of make a case for um, expanding one's view of like what kind of reforms would help protect those 99% of election officials who really believe in doing a good job. Um, certainly those kinds of structural reforms that are gonna get you like published in a fancy law review or a fancy political science journal can be part of the equation. Um, but there's other things that we could think about. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the main examples we have in America when we think about like, oh, like um, sort of uh, independent actors, people who we want to protect as having a sort of independent resist political pressures, judges, right? And so we think of all the kinds of ways that we protect federal judges in particular from political pressure. And so people talk about not being elected, being appointed, life tenure not allowing salaries to be reduced, right? We think of all those kinds of things. Um, but there's actually all these other things we do in America to protect judges, and I want to kind of get people thinking about those things as well. So for instance, we have US Marshals that protect them physically. <laughs> um, they're you know at courthouses. Uh, they keep uh, violence from happening. Uh, we have all kinds of protections in federal criminal law for the safety of judges, witnesses, and prosecutors. So people are often asking me in my work, like, isn't it against the law to dox election workers? And I'm like, no, there's no federal law that prohibits doxing somebody. Like, that's not a federal crime. Um, but it is a federal crime to dox a judge or her family member <laughs> or a witness or a prosecutor. Like, and that's been in the law for a long time. So I want to kind of get people thinking about um, other kinds of maybe less academically sort of cool and <laughs> prestigious uh, forms of reform that we might do uh, along with uh, the kind of structural, you know, uh, constitutional reform uh, sorts of things that folks have been talking about. Uh, so things like um, address privacy protection for election officials, um, 
things that aren't even legal reform, but um, sort of uh, improving the culture of law enforcement and their respect for democracy, maybe civics education uh, for police officers um, so that we can have uh, actually more buy-in from, um, from law enforcement to the idea that, you know, we live in a country where we believe in democracy, right? And a part of their job is protecting the people who administer it. Um, so yeah, I wanna keep my remarks short. Actually, I've revised them a lot from what I plan to say after hearing what everyone else had to say at the conference. Um, but I just, um, I think a lot of us are thinking the same way that, um, you know, there is a sort of social and cultural like loss of these norms <laughs> that's driving all of this. And I think let's add to the mix of um, kind of big, exciting structural reforms. Um, some of these smaller uh, sort of, uh, you know, criminal law uh, adjustments and those sorts of things, um, training adjustments, like how do we train law enforcement? Think about those as uh, part of the mix and part of what we need to do to kind of change change the culture around elections, which I think we all agree is is getting a little bit scary or moving in a scary direction. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'll take it up from there. Again, Isabel Longoria, the former Harris County Elections, Elections Administrator, and, and we're, I think, became pretty famous for in uh, just ahead of 2020, putting in things like drive-through voting, 24-hour voting, sending out mail ballot applications to everyone over 65, and at least at one point attempting to send mail ballot applications to everyone in Harris County and saying, you let us know if you qualify and we'll essentially pay for printing this paper in the stamp because in Texas we only can apply to vote by mail by mail. There's no online voter registration or mail ballot application. So, you know, these very, um, we intended to move or we did move toward vote, towards a voter centric system. And I think that's really important when we talk about the lack of resources for local elections administrators, the incentive then is for elections administrators to figure out how to do more with less. And that often comes up in the form of how can I make the job easier for myself and my staff? And I don't mean that in a negative way, but truly if I don't have the staff I need, then how can we make things faster? How can we automate more? I heard someone talk about that. And the answer was not, well, it's better for voters, you know, it's better for them to be able to go online, it makes it easier for them. The answer often is, well, it'll make it easier for us as an office. And so we were very careful to kind of pose the question, what makes it easier for voters? And then isn't it our duty as a government entity to make that happen? And so there's kind of an interesting shift that I don't think uh, many elections administrators get to ask themselves. And the question I posed to my staff was, if I could wave a magic wand and get you every re resource you need, what would you do? And that question alone helped inspire the staff to thinking instead of a um, scarcity right mentality, thinking in that voter-centric mentality. And then it was my job to go fight for those things. Um, I am an anomaly among elections administrators as well. I think most elections administrators around the country are people who started working in their clerk's office or the voter assessor office on that front line, and then you get promoted, and then you get promoted. And before you know it, you're the county clerk or voter re recorder or whatever it may be, and they don't come from that same world of the way I did with campaigns and politics and I've worked for legislators. So I realized that there's an outside world and perception about elections that is different from, and I think elections administrators are like the purest democracy nerds in the world, right? We believe that everything stems from the ability to vote safely and securely and passing on democracy in a peaceful way, the peaceful transition of power. And so many folks, even with the death threats, even with the pressure on your families, have been in those positions for decades because it is such rewarding work. And there's also a kind of trench mentality. I can say that even in my two years, if I leave, then who does this? If we leave, if we give up, and even more now, there is a sense of we are fearful of who might step in behind us. Um, we're fearful that they don't have all that knowledge. We're fearful of they don't know X, Y, Z location in that history. And so I think for many years, you know, election administration has been seen as a nerdy job that no one really wants. And so there hasn't been the training nationally to say this is something that we want to push people towards, even in my policy wonk world. So coming in. We ran very much a media campaign. We asked ourselves, what can we do to push, you know, former county clerk Chris Hollins and then myself out there, um, because people, general person, doesn't believe in offices anymore. They believe in people. 
You don't care about the office of the president. You don't care about the office of the governor. It's very person driven. And I think that elections administrators have been able to live without having to be that person. But how can we put elections administrators out there and say, this is someone you can trust? No matter what you hear from either party, this person is someone you can trust. And it's not the work that they've done before. Um, and that's all, as Tammy pointed out, very good and well when you're in a large county like Harris County, fourth, third or fourth largest in the country. We had, uh, I think at our height, we were given $30 million alone for the November 2020 election, just one election. Um, that is more than most states will see in a lifetime for voting. We had a county attorney's office that had over 200 attorneys, uh, young Democratic um, progressive who brought with him attorneys from big law firms who were very excited to jump in, who have the expertise, who have enough attorneys to go handle the lawsuits that Harris County, myself incurred, right, defending those, proposing those, teaming up with the Brennan Center and having the expertise and connections to do that nationally to question not only what was happening in Harris County, but you know, famously we teamed up with the Brennan Center um, that at one point a law was passed. So the Texas, sorry, do all these fantastic things. We increase voting, especially among women and interestingly among young Latinos. 24 hour voting was most likely used by young Latinos. Um, the law in reper repercussion said uh, you can't do drive through voting not how can we make it better and not what are the guard rules. You can't do drive through voting. You can't send out mail ballot applications anymore unless you're a political campaign. So it's disincentivizing these nonpartisan groups from doing this work. You can't do 24 hour voting. And uh, the, truly and honestly, the idea was you, nothing good happens at night. That was the response from every legislator. Not more people voted, not more younger people voted, not more people with families voted bad things happen at night and they won the messaging. And this is what I wanna bring up from a campaign perspective. There is a messaging to elections that is going on that I don't think elections offices feel is their job to do, but unfortunately they are the most poised to be um, the folks who people trust and to send out that messaging. I'm gonna hit on a couple points because we're in some law schools. I will say as I've been traveling around and speaking at, in law schools, when I talk to, you know, prospective future attorneys or even county attorneys, I often get questions about the VRA, about the Citizens United case, and I understand the proclivity to teach kind of at this federal constitutional level, but I was just sitting in a class where no one could tell me how the ballot board was structured, what the signature verification committee was, who the election commission is, what the secretary of state actually does for voting rights, and so I think there is actually a space perhaps for you know, all of you in this room to go back to your states and say, can we offer a CLE on how this plays out? And for our county attorneys, um, you know, they were very happy to defend me on the big questions of, we wanna make sure black voters vote. That's fantastic. That's not the questions I had to pose to them. The questions I had to pose to them is, uh, for example, at the end of the night, is a judge allowed to deliver a ballot box back to my office or am I allowed to go pick it up? It's not a sexy question. And because it's not a sexy question, it's not a question that most county attorneys would take on or are interested in doing. And they often said, well, you tell us what the argument is and we'll go fix it. Like, no, no, I, <laughs> you tell me, county attorney, what you're doing to defend me. And this is where I get back to, we had 200 county attorneys, three of which were put on our department alone. If you're in a rural county where you literally have the county attorney and their clerk, and they've got to deal with all these cases, there's not the resources there for them to go out, for them to join the state lawsuits, for them to join these national lawsuits regarding in Texas right now, battleground kind of area for election laws to join these movements. And so what you ultimately got was, it was the Harris County show. So it was me having been trained at the legislature, feeling good talking about to legislators, feeling fine to talk in the media, feeling good of, my famous line was, lawsuits just mean someone has a question. Right, it didn't intimidate me. But then it became, I was the only person standing there. Because of 254 counties, not very many other counties had the backing of their county commissioners to be out front on an issue that would attract such negative media attention, would attract death threats, would attract that side. Um, that uh, those county, uh, sorry, administrators or elections administrators didn't feel comfortable joining lawsuits because they'd never had that experience before. To them, lawsuits are extremely intimidating. And so it became the, well, it's just Harris County trying to do all their weird stuff that we're not even quite sure is legal or not. 
And why can't Harris County just leave it alone and be like the rest of the counties? When in my ear, I have 253 other elections administrators saying, keep fighting, please keep going. My county attorney won't let me join. My district attorney won't let me join. My county judge won't let me join. They don't want to spend money on lawsuits. Please keep going because we agree with you. We're just not allowed to say it. And so I just kind of want to highlight, right, that at the state level, there is much more pressure when it comes to every day, the money to make these things happen. And so, um, you know, Texas doesn't have the funds right now. There's excellent organizations, again, Brennan Center, TCRP, um, that can come in and help but I fear for, for all the other states that maybe don't have that kind of organized effort. Uh, and I will throw out, just because I've got the mic, um, on the other side of election administration, what I've heard throughout this conference too is I stepped in cold. I had no election experience other than running campaigns. And I agree with you. This idea that running a campaign is anything like elections <laughs> is false, absolutely false. I knew it, but I had all these elected officials telling me, well, no, 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 I've been in elections because they do run campaigns, right? They have had to think about the vote. And every elected official has a story where their election went wrong. And so I actually think the majority of election officials are in some form of election denier in this wide umbrella we're calling. Because I one time had a voter tell me they went to go vote, but they weren't on the voter rolls, and therefore there's something wrong with the election office. Not that there was one person who had their paperwork lost in the shuffle, it's not great. Or I one time was running for office and I came down to um, 16 votes. And therefore, because it was a 0.02 percentage, there must be something wrong because I was supposed to win by lion's slide. And I, I will tell you, Democrats and Republicans equally would come in every single election and ask me for a recount. We had, an, uh, I think, about five recount requests in 10 elections that we hosted. Everything from school board to precinct chair to I don't care who knows what, 10 people voted in your election and it came down to one vote and you still want me to recount those 10 votes. I can't tell you enough, we didn't mess up 10 votes. Um, so this perception is election kind of denial goes much further than just at the national or federal level. If people don't win, these elected officials don't win or these candidates don't win, their first assumption is something went wrong with elections. Not necessarily that was rigged, but their first assumption is not, I didn't come across as a candidate, that's impossible, right? Look at me, it's something was wrong with the elections. And so I think that's why it's difficult to break through politically that there's nothing wrong with elections. Yes, we can do better. Yes, there's you know, innocent errors and mistakes because they have felt it themselves and they are the people in power who then make these decisions. So how can you convince the people of their lived experiences that everything is fine? if they have all had experiences that something wasn't. Um, the cost of elections, when I was going through and trying to set our budget and make a, uh, a case for a bigger budget, I could not find a single resource that told me nationally how much money it costs per voter to run an election. And I get that everything's different and I get that every system is different, but I couldn't find any. So all of you academics, please. We came up with, in Harris County, County it cost about $5 per registered voter to run an election. Um, and then we broke it down even further. So uh, it cost $240 per day per worker over a 12 hour day at $20 an hour. So that means for early voting, for example, over a 12 hour day, and about eight people per poll, it cost me $13,440 to run on one early voting site for one day. No, no, sorry, one early voting site for one week. So that's $13,000 to one, run one voting site. And in Harris County, we had 90 voting sites. So you can start extrapolating from there. Those are the real numbers for Harris County that I don't actually think are that far from most communities, even your rural communities. So when you talk about extending hours, most elections administrators are with you. We believe in the principle of having more hours of voting to provide more opportunity. But what I heard from my peers was, that is real money that we can't make up. So if we're running voting from nine to five, and now you want us to run it from seven to seven, that's another four hours, and they start doing the math. They don't have the money to do what they want to do in principle. And so I know it's not sexy, but talking about this money. Um, and to end it with, so you get the sense, I'm a, not a quiet person. I put out a lot of things in writing. Maybe the, my Democratic uh, bosses didn't like that so much about how little we were making. So it cost us $5 per registered voter to run an election, and we were funded at um, $3.50 if we were lucky. Um, 
there's a lot of kind of internal politics on why that and the fights that happen afterwards. And like I said, I'm the former elections administrator, very deeply tied to constantly asking for money. And what I heard from the budget department and the county commissioners was, well, sure, elections, but have you thought about health care? And I was told straight to my face, are you telling me that we should let people die on the streets so that you can have an extra early voting location? It's a very hard thing to say no to, right? And there's a lot of fallacy in that in that it's, you know, taking from one resource or another. But again, you know, any dollar that is spent in a county system is a dollar that is not spent on something else or is a dollar that has to be accrued or made up somewhere. And as someone pointed out, now if we can't take our Zucker bucks and we can't take this outside kind of donations, then we are left only with whatever the county can provide a resource for against other issues. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh, and thank you so much for letting me kind of just share uh, the experiences of elections administrators. Awesome. And um, while you all are formulating some questions to ask, I'll toss one out for the panelists to consider. And that is that, um, Isabel, you said something a few minutes ago that I had to, wrote, uh, had to write down. A lawsuit means someone has a question. Um, <laughs> and I'm wondering um, what each of you thinks about um, the sort of pattern of questioning that's happening right now, if you will, with, with um, a lot of the pre and then very likely post-election litigation that's falling to state courts. Um, in particular, are you confident or worried or both about the answers that you'll get from state courts in some of these suits involving especially voter access and just the procedures of election administration? And then related, um, what are your reactions to the volume of pre-election litigation we're seeing right now, um, which seems to be quite significant across many states? So I don't know, Quinn, do you want to start at that end? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's a lot in this, and so I'll, I'll do my best to address, I guess, most of it, I hope. Um, I think it's, it is clear right now that election administrators are under attack. There's a lot of requests for, or a lot of challenges to voter registrations, for example. Um, I think it's likely that we'll have a lot of challenges to voters at the polls, um, and all that kind of stuff can sort of feed into lawsuits over time. Um, challenging individual decisions. Um, and I guess to, to use an analogy, you know, I when when I have students complete exams, I cap them at 500 words so they can't throw spaghetti at the wall. That's what a lot of this feels like. It feels like litigation by deluge to try to intimidate people. And because as, as you pointed out, not everybody has the legal resources to defend all of these, all these cases all of the time. Um, with respect to, do I have confidence in state courts? Um, I think my logical follow-up would be, which state courts? Um, some of them, absolutely. There are state courts out there that, whether they are controlled by Republicans or controlled by Democrats, I trust them to do the right thing. I think the Michigan Supreme Court is a great example of that. I think the Idaho Supreme Court is a great example of that. I think the Mississippi and Texas Supreme Courts are bad examples of that. And I don't truly know in those states, I mean, Mississippi's not gonna be, there's no close elections in Mississippi, but if, if you know, Better wins in Texas, ostensibly, and the state establishment refuses to recognize that, I have no idea what the Texas Supreme Court would do in practice. Um, and I have very serious concerns about stuff like that. Um, I also have no real in, uh, belief in the integrity of the Fifth Circuit, for example. Um, none whatsoever to do the right thing in that respect. Um, though I am a former 11th Circuit clerk, I can, I can say with confidence that I'm not confident that I have confidence in them. Um, so I don't know. To me, that's one of the more terrifying things, that it's logical to say these are baseless and meritless claims, as they are, but courts are willing to entertain baseless and meritless claims when it suits them, I think, with some amount of frequency. So I'm, I'm frightened of stuff like that. I, I really wish it was the case, and I'm, I'm certainly not saying that you're, you believe that everybody filing a lawsuit is engaging in good faith. Um, I really wish that that was the case, that we, that we had lawsuits in, in this world when, and people were acting in good faith. Um, but I don't have confidence in that. I don't have confidence in every single court to distinguish between the good faith claims and the bad faith claims. And as long as there's a lawyer in a state who's willing to sign their name onto a lawsuit, you're going to have baseless and meritless lawsuits, just as a flat matter. That was very negative, I realize, but. Uh, sure. Yeah, I do think, um, I agree with Quinn that, you know, you can't 
just put all of your faith in any one institution, and uh, state courts are no exception to that. Um, but I'm not so worried about, you know, these baseless, meritless lawsuits being brought and then some really horrible restriction that impacts a ton of voters resulting, right? Like, I think you can, on the margins, get, um, you know, situations where it becomes harder for people to vote, that sort of thing. I think that's all very, very possible. Um, what I'm more worried about, actually, is um, the way in which I believe a lot of these baseless lawsuits um, are really part and parcel of other baseless questions that people are asking, right? So the flood of like FOIA requests uh, that we heard about over the last two days, um, the sort of like push to like have like this, these sort of massive like poll watching monitoring with like way too much suspicion efforts, um, you know, that folks like Bannon are encouraging. I think all of that, like to me, the most sort of immediate danger that I'm worried about is that it just um, provides an even greater sort of seed pool of disinformation narratives that are going to be used by whoever the sore loser is um, after the election. So I think, because it's interesting, you know, there were all these lawsuits filed uh, by the Trump campaign after the 2020 election. and. We've all heard, you know, the stats about like 62 out of 63 of them failed or something like that. Um, I don't think that actually um, helps with the disinformation narrative, right? Like a, a lot of folks, the 70 percent of you know Republicans who believe that the 2020 election was stolen, I don't think they hear that all those lawsuits were lost and think, wow, I guess there really wasn't anything there. <laughs> the election wasn't stolen. I think they hear well, it is really rigged against my guy. <laughs> like, all those judges um, had it in for Trump. And so all the allegations um, that were made in those lawsuits, you actually still see them, like, popping up in disinformation narratives that are, like, still being <laughs> circulated on Telegram. They kind of morph sometimes into other things. But those those lawsuits, like, form the seed for really like long-standing, like long-lasting disinformation campaigns. And so that's actually my more immediate worry about all of this. Not that we're going to get a bunch of like super bad decisions from state courts, but just that um, the fuel and the kindling is, um, is intense. Chaos. 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 We've heard so much about chaos. Um, I think that until we have accountability in this moment and as long as there are incentives for individuals to bring lawsuits that are, in fact, frivolous in most cases, most of them are not based on facts and evidence, um, which, of course, we would appreciate and welcome, um, that we're going to continue to see it. Um, so when we talk about things like the certification and what if somebody decides not to certify, that plays into that ambiguity that I that I mentioned. Um, and there are some states that are looking to try and clear up what we've always kind of looked at as democratic norms of concession and peaceful transfer, and instead making it very clear that if, in fact, a county fails to certify or if, in fact, a clerk um, provides secure access to an unauthorized individual, these will be the, um, the ramifications. So both California and Colorado have some really good, I think, examples of that. Um, but in the lack of that clearly defined structure, that's where I think the states are, are kind of struggling because of that ambiguity, because we have invested so much in what we assumed we could take for granted. And I think um, the 2016 election, where the winner called the election rigged because they didn't win as bigly as they should have, um, and then the 2020 election happens. So I, I think as we move through this very interesting time in our, in our um, country's great experiment, the more we can clearly define what we have, um, what our expectations are um, in how we behave in the moment, um, the better off we're going to be so that we're not relying upon a single judge or a single secretary of state to do the right thing in the right moment and interpret the law correctly. Uh, and I'll add that lawsuits are not just about questioning the law or whether or not a program should or should not be done. 
again, from an outside perspective, it's a wonderful fundraising opportunity for political campaigns and parties. Um, what we saw play out in Harris County was, I mean, and I'm talking mundane, local runoff election with three candidates and 3,000 voters, maybe, we would have the Harris County Republican Party immediately sue us, even before election day, saying, uh, we picked a really very arbitrary law that may or may not we, we win. It doesn't matter because people heard in the headlines that night, Harris County Republican Party again sues Isabel Longoria elections administrator. And there's a couple functions to that. At this point, voters in Harris County are hearing Isabel Longoria gets sued a lot. And the only people who get sued are bad people, right? Good people don't get sued, only bad people. So again, degrading kind of me as the person or the office as a person as a way of questioning elections in general, right? Well, who's running that election office? Because she's getting sued a bunch, whether or not they're paying attention. They might hear that headline that night, election office gets sued, and then temporary injunction hearing two, three weeks later, something case back and forth, something about partial, what I, I don't even know how to describe it, right? They're not hearing the, and then it got thrown out, and then it was frivolous. And if I'm trying to be on my soapbox four weeks later, election day is over. Voters don't care. And I will say this also feeds into whether we know it or not, election, uh, sorry, voters believe elections end on election night, period. And they believe election night ends at, at like 11 p.m. midnight if you're really bad at your job. There is not this perception that then the vote goes on, especially in big counties, and you got to check and double check, and you got to give a week for all the mail ballots to come in and make sure you vote that. Elections end on election night for voters. And that is a perception and messaging issue that I don't think a lot of folks are kind of doing because it's very hard to educate around that, especially when you see our federal and national elections, and I'm sure we've talked about this, where everyone's trying to guess on election night, right, who's winning, who's losing, we want to call it by the end of the night to be the first to call it. Calling it is now what people believe is done with elections. So uh, the legal stuff, it works. I can send out a fundraising email as a Republican and say, we've had to sue that office a hundred times, give us more money so that we can keep suing them because they need us to sue them for accountability. And the Democrats, on the other hand, say they're getting sued left and right, and so give us money because we're the only ones dis defending the Voting Rights Act, which is like nothing to do with anything anymore. But like we're the only ones who are defending democracy, so give us money too. It is as m it, it is very little the actual question. To to your point, it is more about the showmanship of kind of sowing chaos. Okay, I think we have time for at least one question. If anyone wants to ask one. Otherwise, I've got more. <laughs> okay. Oh, Karen. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. Uh, really interesting panel, thank you. Um, my question is a little bit less about election administration in the, or, well, it, it's, it's about the, the voter-centric question because part of what, at least from my, just not my area of expertise, but the messaging that I have, that I see coming from the, the republic, from the right, is that more voting, more voters and more marginal people who don't normally vote, lower propensity voters, minority voters, that's bad. And, and so it feels like it, there's, it's not just a question of pressure on election administration or election denialism, but uh, a, a belief that only some certain types of people should be able to vote and that maximizing the number of voters and maximizing voter convenience is affirmatively a bad thing, not because bad things happen at night, but because we don't want those people to vote. And I'm just curious what all of you think about that. I'll, I'll take a, I'm going to say something very controversial. There is, in the entire United States, there is an incredible effort to influence elections, and that is called political campaigning. <laughs> Right? For all we talk about the elections being rigged and machines, et cetera, political parties and candidates spend hundreds of millions of dollars to target voters that, that they, they think are going to come to them by giving them only certain information and denying other information and by going out of their way to get you to come vote. So it's not about, uh, you're right, the Republican Party kind of muddies the water about like more voters are bad unless they're Republican voters, right? And the Democratic Party does the same, right? More voters are bad unless it's the Democratic Party. And I'm, again, being a Dem Democratic political, et cetera, I can tell you, like, this whole, like, no, we want everyone to vote. Push come to shove. You go to a Democratic campaign office, 
And those Democrats aren't working in Republican parts of town or places where they think people are voting against them, and same for the Republicans. So, you know, everyone is trying to, it's political game theory, everyone is trying to get their voters out. I think, for me personally, in Harris County, where the Republican Party has made a big misstep is they came out against drive-through voting, 24-hour voting, and mail ballot application send out before they saw the results of the election. And so they had already put themselves in a hole of being against these things because the Democratic leadership of Houston was for it. And what you see in the wash of the vote, ultimately in 2020 and, and the couple elections we could do after that is pretty much 50-50. Democrats and Republicans both used it, especially drive-through voting. I think actually drive-through voting was like a hair used more by Republican voters and it tended to be suburban Republican women who liked being able to pack their kids or their parents in a car and just go vote. And so I think that's where they shot themselves in the foot. Had they waited, they would have seen that these measures potentially help their voters and then their messaging around it would have been different. But they were pegged in a hole and that's just Harris County, so that's all I can talk about. But. So I love this question. I think that um, that Isabel is absolutely right. Um, in 2020, there was a lot of concern about voting by mail and whether or not the Postal Service could handle that volume. There's a couple hundred thousand, a couple hundred million people would vote by mail. Billions of mail pieces go out on political mail. So think about your own household. How many mailers do you get from the political side of the house? versus your ballot, maybe your sample ballot, maybe a polling place card. So you're absolutely right. The money is not in elections and election mail for the Postal Service. It is in this political side. So when you ask about voter-centric elections and voter-centric administration, the Presidential Commission on Election Administration was a bipartisan team. We came up with some really practical recommendations, both from D's and R's and independents, um, because we know that these policies I kind of put blinders on. I mean, we're here in, in Arizona where the vast majority of Republicans have been voting by mail for decades here. Um, and so the fact that that has been weaponized is a really interesting way that I often say it keeps people engaged, enraged, and donating, right? And these messages that get put out there, it's, it's, you're absolutely right, it's so much easier to amplify these, these anti-democratic messages, to amplify the rhetoric than it is to actually hack a system. Um, and this amplification is being done not only domestically, but we have foreign adversaries and anti-democratic forces that are sitting back just loving watching us eat, a, eat our own um, in this moment. And so I think that, that there is a greater global impact to what we're seeing. Um, and that's why I think we do need to just keep coming back to the voter and reminding people that in this moment, um, they still have the power to elect people in November that believe that their votes should count and that their vote should have counted in 2020 and should count again in 2024. I might push back a little bit on a part of what Isabel said, um, because I, I'm not, obviously it is the case that campaigns want their own people to vote. I totally agree. But the rhetoric is materially different when Republicans talk about election results they don't like and Democrats talk about election results they don't like. Even going back to 2012, when Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan lost, Paul Ryan attributed their loss to the urban vote. I mean, when Scott Walker lost in 2018, so many people said, well, if you just took out Milwaukee and Madison, then Scott Walker would have won. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> if you took out like all these rural places, then Tony Evers would have won by an even bigger margin. Um, and that, that's kind of the rhetoric. You know, when Matt Bevin lost in Kentucky, it was, oh, it's because of urban voters in Louisville. That was the reason. Um, and so we're, Republicans are not always treating all votes equally that votes from rural areas, from rural white people in particular, should matter more. I mean, that gets to like age old disputes about how we should allocate legislative districts and, and well beyond. But when Democrats talk about election results where they lose, the point is not always, oh, we shouldn't count votes from Republican areas, or hmm, a lot of voters voted in this area, that's a little sketchy. The response is usually, understand the disparity in access to polling places in white areas versus black areas. Understand that in Atlanta in 2018, polling technology failed at black precincts more than it did at white precincts. And you know the response to 
Democrats lost in the 2021 Virginia gubernatorial election was not, oh, there was cheating, there were all these false votes, et cetera. It was acknowledging that their side didn't turn out as much and Republicans turned out a lot more. And so I think that, you know, to your point, the way that politicians talk about votes is fundamentally different. And there's a lot of, um, I guess, memes, for lack of a better word, that proliferate in sort of this right-wing media ecosystem that are easily disprovable, but reinforce perceptions about stuff like that. Like, I remember my grandfather sharing some meme that was like, you know, oh, if you look at, you know, the total number of votes in Palm Beach County and Broward, it exceeds the number of people who live there. Things that are demonstrably false, easily disprovable, but reinforce ideas that in communities of color, there's more people voting, it's cheating, it's fraudulent, there's not a, a perception that all votes are being cast equally, or I think if we really get down to it, that not all votes should be counted equally. That when you have these blue islands and seas of red, the way to deal with that is not to acknowledge that, yeah, the blue areas can sometimes outvote the red areas, but to have a state level electoral college, which was a solution proposed um, after the 2019 victory by Democrats in Kentucky. That to me is much more suggestive than Stacey Abrams saying, you know, this legit, had this election been conducted fairly, I don't know what the result would have been. What she said may have been imprecise, but I, I think you know equating that to how Republicans talk about results when they lose is not the same. And so I think that that we're not treating votes equally. Um, I guess I would say thank you, Quinn, for bringing up something that, as stimulating and wonderful as this conference has been, I think has been really under talked about <laughs> at this conference, which is the sort of um, underlying like racist and white supremacist narratives that are bound up in this election denialism movement. And that, you know, it's why all of us are so worried about what's gonna happen in the future, right? It's because it's not the same. Like there has been a real resurgence of, um, yeah, of a really sort of like racist, white supremacist, um, you know, refusal to accept a peaceful, multiracial democracy that's underlying a lot of this. So thank you um, is probably going to be my main comment for bringing that up. Um, in terms of how to respond to it, I would say that, you know, I think a lot of what is going on is, um, you know, it's a, and we've talked about it a lot, um, folks on different panels at this conference, it's, you know, a change in social norms, it's a cultural problem, right? There's like, there's so much education that needs to be done. Um, and I've noticed yesterday there were a lot of positive comments made about the civil rights movement in America, but I felt like the sense was like, how awesome of a 14th Amendment, how awesome of a constitution we have that it allowed that to happen. And we didn't remember also like how awesome the actual people who put their lives on the line, who devoted all that time, the, the heroes of that movement, like we didn't talk about any of them. Um, so I think there's, um, this is kind of going back to the original point I wanted to make in my remarks, which is that in addition to thinking about design reforms, structural reforms, those sorts of things, I do think we also need to pay close attention to the kind of broader social change and activism that is required uh, to fight back against the kind of, you know, resurgent racism that we're seeing. conference. So let me just say a sentence or two in closing. It has been such a wonderful, interesting, stimulating set of discussions. I heard from so many people how nice it was to be together and see people again. I absolutely share that sentiment. And I especially want to thank Carol and Steph and Isis and Jay for their really gracious hospitality here in Phoenix. Um, so with that, please join me in thanking panel four. Thank you.